Okay, so thanks everyone for coming uh, for your lunch hour to listen to the young and the old of uh, accelerating genetic gain in plant breeding. Oh, sorry, one of those. The two, two very young uh, people can present today. I'm, I'm, I'm excited because I've had the great pleasure of working with Wallace for close to 20 years, I think, and um, he's finally come around to an animal science perspective on plant breeding, oh. which is fantastic. <laughs> I thought it would never happen, but it has. And um, I see that as a big win. No, it's actually because he's been so open-minded about um, how to, to uh, improve uh, yields and, and plant breeding, the speed of plant breeding. And Philippe, uh, I've been lucky enough to have in, in uh, units through the, the Masters. I'm so pleased that you're doing a PhD. Yeah. And um, and both of the talks today there are, are then about accelerating genetic gain in plant breeding. It's such a critical topic for where we are with the, the planet and, and what, what our needs are. So I, I won't take any uh, longer to introduce uh, Philippe. We'll be talking first. Uh, speaking first and talking about multivariate analysis increases accuracy of predictive breeding values for low heritability in field peas. Just the fact that you've got breeding values in your title gives me great hope. <laughs> Thanks, for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so good day, everybody. So as Phil mentioned, I'm going to tell you about uh, how we're using multivariate analysis to increase the accuracy and prediction of breeding values for traits with low heritability. I'm doing this on field P, but we can apply this to any subterranean crop breeding. And when we talk about the breeding of subterranean crops, uh, the traditional approach is that I'm going to be here. Yeah? So you need to use the microphone for people to hear. Should be okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, so the traditional approach on self pollinating crop breeding is that we have a crossing event and we obtain our first generation hybrids, which is normally highly variable. And then we allow that population to self. And we repeat that for several cycles, maybe six, seven, eight generations, until we are able to select on something that's more pure. And then we can select and do crossing and repeat the process again. Breeders do this because through selfing and replication, we are able to increase the precision in our selection. We are more confident about what we see on the field trials. However, when we do this, we increase cycle time. And these two concepts have been named before in this conceptual equation, that's the breeders equation, which is a good guideline for breeders because it tells us how some variables interact with each other and affect the response to selection on the next generation, which is also known as genetic gain in the next generation. That's the big R on the equation. And the equation tells us that this response to selection is directly affected by the intensity of selection, the accuracy of the breeding values, and the genetic variability of true breeding values in the population. And it's inversely affected by the length of the breeding cycle. Breeders have control over some of these variables, but these variables interact with each other as well. As we saw before, I could increase my accuracy at the cost of a higher cycle, bigger cycle. And an optimal breeding program has to balance these competing interests between the variables inside the rear equation. It's a good guideline. This is a conceptual equation because some of these values, we are never going to know them. But nonetheless, it gives a good idea of what happens and what can we do as breeders. On my research, I'm focusing on those two previous, I mean, previously mentioned variables, which is the little r, the accuracy, and the length of the breeding cycle. In particular, I want to know if I can increase the accuracy and reduce cycle length at the same time. I want to do this because I want to increase my response to selection. And previous research that tried to address uh, adopting early generation selection uh, met some uh, unintended consequences, uh, encountered some issues. Namely, when they select on early generations, we are selecting on this highly variable population and we sacrifice a bit of accuracy. And previous research shows that while they were able to improve the target rate, they met unintended consequences on other important traits. So in the end, readers prefer to self before selection of multiple traits. How I want to address this? Well, I want to know if it's possible to improve the accuracy of reading values on early generations by improving our statistical models with correlated information from relatives and correlated traits. I want to do this because I want to improve 
parent selection for crossing. And also, I want to be aware of correlations between traits that I could miss and could cause unintended consequences. So I want to know if we can reduce the cycle length without sacrificing accuracy for selection of multiple traits with low heritability. And while I'm on that, I also want to know how important it's selfie to improve our accuracy. I've been working with Philpy, uh, mainly focusing on two traits, which are black spot resistance and stem strength. And almost 50 years of peering, only minor improvements has been on these two traits. So black spot, also known as a scocchito light spot, like a blight, is still a serious disease. It affects uh, many regions, uh, causing damage up to 30% of yield. And there is no major resistance on the genotypes. And stem strength, these still tend to grow like this. They go flat on the ground and, and they lodge when they mature. And bring mostly improve the tendons of the plant, so they are better at growing, but I feel like the stem itself has not been properly addressed. So we want to know if we can accelerate genetic progress for these traits. To analyze this, I use linear mix models. I use AS Remo version four on R. And I use these models because with them, I can predict genetic values for each trait that's what we call a blood, uh, best linear and biased prediction. I can also model a uh, spatial trends on the field trial, so I can explain more variability for my trials. And I can specify different body structure uh, for different terms. And I'm going to touch on that a bit later. The first important thing of these models that I can include correlated information. So I can use correlated information from traits by doing a multivariate analysis. And I can incorporate relationship information from relatives. And that's the first important thing that I, knew, uh, that I need to improve my analysis. Relationship information could be pedigree or genomic information. I only have access to pedigree for now, so that's what I use for my analysis. And it's key because that allows the model to access the additive genetic variance, the reading value of the traits. So to exemplify this with my data, this is my data for grain yield on the, on the trial. And what I want to do is I, I observe a variability in the trait, and I want to explain that, what's genotype here. So when I fit the model, the first thing that I try to do is I try to understand what's unexplained variability, residual variability, the error, and I want to know which part of this variability is due to my genotype. But that's not the full picture, because inside this genetic variability, there are some components that, while related to the genotype, they are not uh, able to pass on to the next generation on cross. And here's where pedigree information is key, because with that, the model is able to understand the underlying makeup of the population. And I can dissect that genetic variability into a non additive variability and an additive part. And that's the important one, because that's the one that's heritable. That's what we call the reading value. And that's what we use to do breeding. Normally, we refer to this proportion between additive variability and the overall variability in a proportion from zero to one. That's what we call narrow sense heritability. And if I show you this for my traits, you will see that aside from flowering time, internal length on my diet, and maybe branches, most of my traits have a really small component of ID part. So pedigree information is key because that way I can address this small variability better and I can do better breed. So I will use pedigree information for all my models. The other thing I want to do is I want to see if a multivariate model improves over a univariate model. And to briefly describe my, the models I use, on my univariate model, I try to estimate a random effect of the genotype for each for the trait. I was able to use an autoregressive spatial model to explain that field variability for that trait. And I was also able to include more fixed and random spatial terms if they were significant and help the model. And I also able to use a residual model for the trait and I'm able to get that a trait residual variability that I use to calculate heritability. The multivariate model is really similar conceptually with a few key differences that I'm going to highlight. In these models, I'm again trying to estimate a random effect of genotype, but I'm doing this for traits. And that means that here's when I can change my variance structure and I can allow the model to estimate covariance between trait effects. Again, I can fit an autoregressive spatial model as a random effect, but this time I fit a separate structure for each trait. And I, again, can feed more uh, fixed and special terms if they are significant. And similarly to genotype, with the residual effect, I'm also able to change the variance structure, and I can allow for uh, the model to estimate covariance within residual effects if that's something that will improve the model. 
So the main two key differences are that I'm able to change variance structure when I have a combined effect of traits. And that's the most important thing of the multivariate model. So I have my univariate model and my multivariate model, and how do I compare them? First, I can look at the components they produce, so like heritability, for example, like we did before. But I also want to use the models to predict values for each line, and I want to know how accurate are my predictions. So I need to estimate the accuracy of predicted breeding values. I'm using this equation here that tells me that I can estimate an accuracy of prediction for a given genotype by using the standard error of that genotype of the prediction, the inbreeding coefficient that comes from the pedigree information, and the trait genetic variance that comes from the model. And since this gives me a value per line, what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare the mean accuracy of prediction across models. So I have my strategy, I run my univariate models, I got my components, uh, I predict with them, I estimated accuracy. But when I went into my multivariate model, I ran into the first challenge, which is, What's a multivariate model? What goes into that model? This was the field trial that we, we scored that for several traits. I'm working with 10 traits right now. And when I try to do a multivariate model, I have to decide what goes in there. So first, for example, I, just to see what happens, I tried a 10 trait analysis and that failed. That was maybe too heavy. Maybe it doesn't make sense to combine all the traits, but I know now that I'm not able to just run a single model for all my traits. I have to decide. How do I divide this or how I group these traits? And a good uh, thing that I could do here is follow what animal breeders do. I should look at the genetic correlations between traits. But I don't have that. So I need to estimate those genetic correlations. And the most simple way I could do that is to follow to the most simple multivariate model, which is the bivariate model. I can run a quick bivariate model for two traits and estimate the correlation between those traits. And that's what I did. So if I had 10 traits, that's mean, that means that I have 45 correlations, 45 models to run. I did that, and I obtained this. So this is my first look at the genetic correlations between traits. And this is good information that I can use to decide how do I group these traits. Uh, in my data, I tried several combinations. And in the end, I settled for doing three models. I did a four-variable model between brain yield, biomass, number of branches, and flowering time. I did another four variable model between stem strength traits, stem buckling, stem diameter, compression thickness, and the black spot trait as quite a light score. And uh, lastly, I kept a bivariate model between early angle and internal length, which had the highest negative correlation among the traits. And I want to see what happens if I improve over that model. So I have my models and I'm able to compare them. We can look at the outputs now. If we first look at narrow sense heritability for univariate models and multivariate models, we see that for most of them, we were able to improve our estimates of narrow sense heritability. And in some cases, we were able to uh, trim the standard error a little bit. So this means that we are more confident about the values and the multivariate model is able to explain a bit more of genetic variability respective to the overall trait variability, which is good. I want that. If we look at the accuracy of the models, we see again that the multivariate model produces a higher accuracy of predictions. Good, I want that. Uh, again, here I'm just showing you a zeros, which means that I'm only focusing on the mean accuracy of those first generation hybrids, so the most variable part of the population. And we see that they all increase at different degrees. Uh, if you remember, for example, uh, flowering time here and internal length, those were the traits with the highest heritability. And those are the traits that experience the the minimal improve here, so the less improvement, which is which means that they are already good traits and there's probably not so much that we can do about them. But when we look at traits with low heritability, like brain yield, biomass, and stem buckling, those had a higher increase. So it means that this is good for some traits with low heritability. If we keep looking at accuracies, I showed you the zeros before, and they are here. And I want to know if this will improve as I self more. And so on my population, I also had access to uh, S2s, S3s, and S4s, so higher self feeding levels. And I also had some replicated control varieties, which we can treat as the highest level of self that I could have. And we see that, yes, indeed, as I go more self on my uh, genotype, I increase the accuracy of predictions. But it's important to note that 
Nonetheless, I'm starting a really good value with these improved models. So on the S zeros, I immediately have a good value. I would be comfortable selecting here on the S zeros. They are already good accuracy and I should get good um, predictions to the future and selecting with them. Lastly, these multivariate models gave me a better understanding of the correlation between traits. I'm just showing you the example of the STEM strain and disease model here. I had um, four traits. This means that I have six correlations to estimate. And we can see that all of them are significant in different degrees. But I want to focus on these two, which uh, are the correlation between STEM buckling and compression thickness with disease, which is fairly significant and considerable on, on strength. Uh, this means that we are in the presence of a correlation that is not good for us, so in favor of, because this will mean that as I select for higher stem strength, I could lead the population into higher disease levels, and I don't want that. And this is key. So now that I know this, I know that I need to address this situation when I construct my selection index. What am I doing now on the PhD? I want to validate this approach using genomic information. Literature says that I should improve further if I use genomic information. And I want to know what will happen if I combine two sources of information, so pedigree and genomic, into what is known as a H blob analysis, H for hybrid. It's been done in other crops, so I feel that I will get good improvements on my people population if I do that. What are the practical obligations for bringing of this? First, a selection index that comes with from good, accurate breeding values, it's optimized when I use correlations. So I can create a better selection and use that to fit a selection, an optimized selection scheme, such as optimized mating designs with optimal contribution selection. So this better index will allow me to get more benefits from OCS. And optimal contribution selection improves the long-term genetic gain and retains variability in the population. That's what I use for breeding. So all this should lead to improve longevity of reading programs. So if we go back to the research questions, was it possible to improve the accuracy of reading values by improving the statistical models? Yes, completely possible. We include uh, correlated traits, we improve information from relatives, and we improve the accuracy. This means that we can reduce the cycle while keeping a good level of accuracy and for traits with low heritability, and we can undertake early generation selection and crossing. Uh, how important is selfing to increase accuracy? It's important, we, we saw that it increases, but I think that the, the opportunity lost when you wait for more generations to increase selfing, it's not good compared to just using more opportunities to cross and select. Also, it's important to note that as you saw, I had selfing on my population, they are not going away. If it's a good genotype, the, the model retains that genotype. So they are still going to be present. But we now open the window to select on a zeros. And that's, not, that's something that we should do. The last thing I want to mention is that all this is free. There's no cost of adopting this. It's just how we tackle the data and how we analyze it. So green programs shouldn't have problems incorporating a methodology like this. And they should be able to get gains from this. And that's it. Um, just we'll, we'll do some questions before Wallace uh, starts as well. I think it's important that we do that and we can all have questions at the end as well. But have we got any questions for Philip on this part of the talk? Yeah. So parent lines and courses that you have to make to generate all this data and is there sort of an optimal idea of number? Yeah, so as many statistical things as you increase the number is better, so the bigger n is the better thing. Uh, this is cycle three of the population. So this means that I'm, I'm using this population that Wallace developed um, before. And so far, I have 4,000 lines on the value file. Of those, uh, 1,200 went into the field. So that's my n number. Uh, and I just figured, like I said, back to the founders of the world. So that's 4,000 lines. If I had more, it would be much better. We also have seen that when the baby gets to give, also the analysis gets slow. So it's, uh, you can see, maybe not all of them contribute in the same way. But for my problem right now, I have 4,000 lines, and this year I'm going to incorporate 
almost 2,000 more because it keeps growing. Something uh, just so the I know in animal production, obviously, the accuracy is by incorporating genomic information, yeah. that's where they've gone, and um, and you know, that's in your sites for future yeah. work. Um, the genomic information is it there? Like, are you going to need to get that genomic information, or is it sort of in the databases around that will no, help no. you incorporate I'm, your, your I'm trying to get that from my plants, yeah, so good. yeah. Uh, with a lot of help, I collect big samples this year. Yeah. Uh, we send that and we're waiting for the results. Okay. Yeah. So, but not from this population, so it's the next cycle. So this was cycle three. Yeah. I have genotypic data from cycle four. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. So I will see if next year if this improves. Yeah. I have the baby for everything, so I should be able to mix those two. Yeah. And the selection, sorry, <laughs> sorry to take, the selection index, have you started to put that together? Or, well, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a difficult thing mm. because there's no right answer on the mm. selection index. No. But we have tools. So, for example, there's a software that I use, it's called the site. Uh, inputs that I need is their ability. I improve that with the models. Yeah. Correlations, I get better correlations with the model. Phenotypic as well, you get that from the data. And then you can see your what's possible, or theoretically possible for your traits. So, that's my first approach. Uh, I have wishes, so I want. Um, more resistant to black spots, so lower black spot score. I want more yield, more stem strength. So I'm going to see if that's possible with the numbers, and then I'm going to try different index, and I'm going to model that mm, on a yeah. software like Mazo, for example. So I need to model that. And the correlations are so powerful because sometimes you can make more response in your desired trait by selecting on a different one. Yes. So that all yeah, comes yes. Through in there. And you see that immediately on the model. Mm. So. Yeah, mixed model, we just start on yeah. and it pumps. So as soon as you enable correlations, the model changes completely. Yeah. Same data, you didn't change anything that said, yes, I have correlations. It yeah. improves completely. Um, so we've got some questions up here. Sorry to all those online, I, I, I got distracted. Um, so here, I think it is uh, from UNE. Um, Thanks, Philippa, for the great talk. Just a quick question. Any specific reasons to choose particular four traits for multivariate analysis? Well, no particular reason. It's a bit of try and error. Um, there is no right answer. I tried different combinations. I, I tried some trivariate analysis. I tried with five variables. When I reach five, more is start to break down. Maybe it's too complex or it's not accurate. Uh, I found a sweet, sweet spot on the data with four traits, but it will change. Maybe on my next cycle, I will try the same thing and it won't be the optimal. I will need to change the analysis. But that's what I look at the correlations. It's the first starting point. And another one there from Daniel. Um, why would the pedigree plus genomic data improve accuracy? If the pedigree is from within family, it may not, much, may not be much improvement uh, over the pedigree. Phone. Yeah, so I think that the, the, the basic thing here is that as I get more information, uh, I get a better model. So th those are two separate uh, related to information sources. If I mix them, I should be able to get improvement all, and that's a whole different thing. How do I mix them? Do they go 50-50? Do they all mean the same? You have to weigh that data. That's what I have to do now. Uh, I should see improvements for lines because Peggy will tell me which lines are related at a level and genomic should improve into that. So I don't know for my data, but I'm expecting to see changes and improvements when I combine them. That's what the literature says, and we've seen that in different curves. So I don't have reason to think that it will be different here. My Lord, absolutely. Very good, excellent. Um, you were able to take a lot of painful measurements from these individual plants, etc. But in a practical breeding program with a number of multiple crosses, Basically, you may be able to do only visual observations. All those. So, how, how can you explain how this is going to be? Useful? So, yeah. well, that's the important thing about understanding correlations, and that's uh, something that I expect to see on the next cycle that I'm running right now. And in theory, with a good model and a good prediction model, I should be able to select for something that I'm not necessarily seeing on the field. So, for example, a stem strength is a difficult trait. It's slow and a bit painful to measure sometimes. Mm -hmm. So if I can grow a trial on the glass house, for example, which is much easier, and I'm able to get a good measurement there, and I can relate that to the model, 
I should be able to select for that, not going into the field and growing the full crop just to assess stem strength. Similarly with other traits. So that's what I hope. I exploit the correlations and just make selection a bit easier. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks, okay. Felipe. Thank you. Can you join me in thanking Felipe Everton? Thank them both at the end of their session. The next group from uh, Professor Cowling, who has been working with NPZ for a number of years and, of course, is one of the associate directors of the Institute. Wallace, you're going to bring us home this, uh, this lunchtime and, and uh, really have forged a, a path in, in, in what Felipe has just spoken about, made the connection with UNE and some of those guys and you've integrated that into um, your canola program. So really looking forward to hearing where you're at with all of that. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Phil. Um, as Phil said, we have some connections with the University of New England, and one of them is that Phil Verco is a graduate of UNE, I believe. <laughs> and we have watching today. Hello, Kia. Um, Kia is my, uh, I'm a co-supervisor of Kia at UNE with Dr. Lee Lee. And uh, so we have lots of connections. Um, another connection is optimal contribution selection, which you heard the name. Um, I didn't know anything about this term, this software, until I went to one of Phil's Agri 4405 lectures, where he invited Mark Henry on to give us a lecture to his students. And how privileged are we that we've got a world expert in uh, animal breeding giving a talk to us, and he talked about optimal contribution selection. Well, it turns out that one of the leading software co-authors of OCS is uh, Professor Brian Kinghorn at the University of New England, now Emeritus. And I straight away, or well, within a year or so, went to visit Brian. And this talk is really a result of that connection. Um, a lot of the information that Felipe has presented is a result of this connection. So... Um, um, I think we have a very proud um, connections with UNE, uh, the world's one of the world's leading animal breeding institutes. So it's good fun working with these guys and having connections through Phil and others. And today I want to summarise the results of eight years of research in canola breeding. Uh, canola breeding at this university is fully funded by a private company in Germany called NPZ. And NPZ has uh, been a strong supporter of UWA research in canola since 2000, the year 2000. And that connection has been incredible. Uh, we think that we've given something to NPZ and we know that we've received an awful lot coming back. Um, and I hope today that that um, benefit to NPZ is clear because in the future, they will have um, ideas generated from this research. Now, not every breeder in the world can sit down and do eight years of research in a commercial breeding program. And I highly appreciate the fact that this is research and it's been supported by a private company here at UWA. But it's research with a very practical goal. And the goal that we face, the challenging goals that we face as plant breeders are numerous. Uh, we're very good at creating elite performance in our breeding programs. Um, we have highly inbred breeding programs. I didn't know what that meant until I studied quantitative genetics with Phil lecturing in Agri 4405. Um, so as a plant breeder, I came into this game behind the eight ball because I didn't understand uh, these terms. So inbred, means population in breeding. That means all the varieties that are inside the breeders program are highly related, closely related genetically. And if they were animals, they would fall over with uh, problems of inbreeding depression. But we're lucky we work in self and crops, so we don't have to worry about that. 
But our rate of genetic gain is slow because of this narrow genetic diversity. It decreases our potential to adapt to rapidly changing climates. Really serious problem facing plant breeding is that we should be adapting our breeding populations to the world of changing temperatures and climates that is happening out there in the field. Um, it's also very difficult to benefit from other breeders' advances. Um, for example, inside the NPZ breeding program, they have spring canola breeding in Canada, Germany, and Australia. But until we started this research, it was very hard to swap germplasm, not physically, but biologically, because the genetics, you could do crossing, but then the progeny looked awful. So it's very hard to migrate between programs when you're so highly adapted to your local regional environment and you don't have much genetic diversity. So this is the goal. And can we devise a new global breeding system? So sharing global genetic improvements would seem like a logical thing for a multinational company like NPZ to do, but it's very difficult to do. Increasing genetic diversity appears to be one of the key elements of this, and increasing genetic gain depends on diversity. But we also want this to be affordable and feasible. Um, it should be use, usable in developing and developed countries. And we have Renu here working with beans in Africa, um, applying the same principles that we're talking about today. And we should be able to integrate new technologies as they become available and affordable. Well, thanks to MPZ, Felipe's PhD is now supported to allow genomic testing of the pea population. So he can now include genomic information as he goes forward. So we have a test case. We have isolated elite spring canola breeding pools in Australia and in Europe and Canada. The Canadians and Europeans have no trouble swapping germplasm because they're both growing spring canola in summer months. So they plant in the early summer, they harvest in the late summer. In Canada, you've got about a 75-day window to do that. In Australia, we have a very different scenario. We have the same type of phenology, but we plant it in April or May, and it going into winter months, not much happens, comes out in the spring, and it's got to be really fast to flower, set seed, and harvest before the water runs out at the end of the growing season. So a similar origin of germplasm, but when we first brought Canadian germplasm into Australia, it fell over with disease, it was too late, it was too tall, it was not going to work. So rapeseed in Australia had a very slow start because of this problem of not being able to interact with the breeders in the Northern Hemisphere, genetically interact. So in 2012, um, this little project at UWA began crossing elite lines from partners in the NPZ group. Um, it is a real relief, I tell you, when you have the intellectual property managed by the companies, you don't have to worry about IP issues. So we just did the crossing because it's all part of the same company. And that is really helpful. So we started breaking down this barrier between the two um, regions in terms of genetics. And of course, as I mentioned, this project at UWA is part of a commercial breeding program. We're getting material uh, released to licensees in Australia. We don't actually do the commercialization here. Germany does all of that. But we have the exciting part of generating new varieties. Now, uh, there's an upside and a downside to breeding with genetic diversity like this in global spring canola breeding. The downside is our knowledge from intercrossing Canadian and Australian germplasm suggests that it's not going to give you a good result. Very susceptible progenies to blackleg disease. Uh, we have the hottest blackleg climate in the world here. So you have to have resistance. The plants tend to be very tall because they're used to growing in summer. Now they're growing in the winter months in southern Australia. So they're just reaching for the sky <clears throat> and they're late flowering. 
So your performance is going to suffer if you start crossing between northern and southern hemisphere global spring canolas. You're going to release extreme genetic diversity. Well, I don't mind. That's why I started crossing. But if you're a commercial breeder, how much of this diversity is useful? It's going to be difficult to main support of somewhat sceptical partners and I have to be grateful for the fact that the Canadians and the Germans have uh, been very supportive over the years. But when they look at this material in the field, they go, ooh, it's not looking the greatest here, Wallace. Okay, And we'll see some of those results. On the upside, potentially superior genetic gain in the medium to long term, um, we hope that we can now achieve results going forward that are unachievable at the moment. We can exploit genetic diversity with new breeding strategies that are becoming available in plant breeding, coming out of UNE and other places around the world, developing animal software for plant breeding, including index selection and optimal mating designs. And it's really important if you're a plant breeder to not overdo it with a new methodology like this. So do it small, be modest, demonstrate value to your partners as quickly as you possibly can. So here's the model of breeding that we set out with great ignorance in 2014 cycle one. Um, now we've reached cycle four in 2020, two years per cycle. So in each cycle you're testing and selecting. And in each cycle, it's very practical commercial breeding program. We're bringing in migrants. In practice, what we had in the beginning was 32 parents from Australia, 32 from Canada and Europe. These were intercrossed to create F1s, and those F1s were intercrossed again to create a genetically segregating S0 progenies. So it doesn't sound like much variation, but those 64 parents represent an effective population size that is probably four times bigger than an average breeding program in Australia. So we know we're starting with a good population size. We know we're also in a very ignorant state of animal breeding. We don't know how to yet to adapt to the modern systems of animals. So this process started in a primitive way, but it ended up using all these tools. And the Material has to be tested. So we created huge trials of about 2,000 plots, massive trials. And Yasenka's here from the canola breeding program. Yasenka, thank you. Um, she's been through these trials and measured things on them. And Sadiq asked a very good question, well, how much can you measure? Yasenka, I don't know how much you can measure, but you've done an amazing job with Roz and Yasenka, just two people. All of this data in Australia has come from them, but you'll see a few places like CA, that's Canada. Um, we were able to send entire trials packeted ready for sowing into Canada. Um, so that was really, really advantageous in the last two cycles, because now we could start testing simultaneously in Australia and Canada. AU1 represents Western Australia. AU2 represents a black leg nursery in Eastern Australia. So we've got lots of diversity in testing sites. And the biggest problem plant breeders have, which animal breeders don't have to worry about, is that you're actually getting multiple locations tested with your genotypes in them. So you're measuring two things. You're measuring locations and you're measuring genotypes and how they perform at those locations. Not quite the same in animals where the animals tend to be walking around in one farm for most of their life, um, but they do have GYE in animal breeding too. So we can learn from animals for GYE, genotype by environment interaction also. The connectivity between varieties across cycles doesn't look that great. You can see within cycles, within cycle uh, 2016, we have connectivity within cycle 2018, within cycle 2020, but between cycles, it looks very weakly connected. Is this a problem? We didn't know until we started analysing the data. But we did have some experience from peas and Katia Stefanova, a biometrician you will all know, um, helped us analyze this data and the pea data 
earlier to show that it is helped immensely by having pedigree relationships between cycles. And I've taken this example because I want to show you how the, a snapshot of pedigrees for one particular variety growing in the field in cycle three, how its pedigree is related back through parents. And where you see two lines together, what do you think that means? Two lines together here, here. What does that mean? Selfing, selfing. thanks, yeah, selfing. And most people think about selfing as something that just happens in plant breeding programs and we don't worry about it, we just do it. But here it's, it's treated as a cross. Why not? Pollen interacts with an ovule and creates an embryo. It's exactly the same process as crossing, right? And what we can do down the bottom here is very, very interesting. We can actually grow and test the self progeny and the cross progeny in the same experiment. This is really valuable. Why? Because you've got S0 progenies in the experiment and now you've got their parents also in the experiment and the parents are related by selfing and crossing. And this type of relationship is never seen in animal breeding and yet we're exploiting it here to get improved accuracy of breeding values and it's been extremely beneficial. It's also helped us make this a commercial breeding program because now we have self lines getting tested in the field next to the first generation progenies, which have yet to be selfed. But we'll get a breeding value as Felipe demonstrated. We need to access that breeding value with pedigree information. Pedigree information is cheap, as long as you record it on a database. It doesn't cost you anything to recall it. And analyse with it is your time. So breeders are going to have to get used to this idea that we're analysing data with modern software that's available and we can do it. If I can do it, everybody can do it, right? Renu, Renu's picked it up in the last year. She's running great guns with us. Felipe's picked it up in the last 18 months since he's finished his uh, Masters. Felipe has combined Pilar's master's thesis and his thesis. Pilar's gone back to Argentina and Felipe was lucky to get a scholarship. So he's now working on that thesis data from two students. And in 18 months, he's learned all this software. It's taken me eight years, but Felipe did it in 18 months. <laughs> but we've made a decision to only include cycles two to four in the analysis because cycle one I really didn't know what I was doing and it's very poorly connected to the rest and it's cycle one is testing all the progenies of all that crossing that came directly between Canada or Europe and Australia so there's a lot of tall stuff in it we um, tried we had to throw away a lot of material in cycle one and I didn't know what I was doing hopefully now I do know a bit more and now we've been able to analyze the data through cycles two to four, with a lot of help from Katia, uh, Dr. Lee Lee in University of New England and others, uh, Brian Kinghorn in University of New England. And we've been able to come up with heritability, narrow sense heritability for multiple important economic traits in canola breeding across cycles two, three, and four. And you can see here that the mean narrow sense heritability is actually very acceptable. Everything's above 0.4. Uh, some sites had very low narrow sense heritability. So the site was suffering from drought in, in that uh, particular case. Uh, some traits have very high heritability, like oleic acid, the proportion of oleic acid in the oil. Um, oil and protein are mid heritabilities. Um, days to vow flower, very strongly heritable. So we've got results from pedigree analysis that are giving us very acceptable heritabilities and we can now start index selection on all those traits. Uh, <clears throat> we also noticed that there were quite strong genetic correlations between sites for yield. <clears throat> now this is very useful. My experience with advanced 
trials is that you get very high GYE. But in this early generation <coughs> material, all of the material has positive genetic correlations between sites through cycles two to cycle four. And you'll see groups of very highly correlated sites. And guess what? Sun Valley in Manitoba is very highly correlated with Sun Valley in Manitoba. That's good. But Sun Valley in Manitoba is very highly correlated with Williams in the next cycle. So Williams south of here, very highly correlated yield. Breeding values are the same whether you test in Williams or in Sun Valley, Manitoba. I was shocked. Totally shocked. I, everybody told me you can't do this. You cannot cross between Canadian and Australian germplasm and come up with useful material. But here we are selecting in either Australia or Canada for the same trait, and it's highly correlated. It blew me away. In fact, the correlations between Canada and Australia are the same as Canada and Canada. So it doesn't matter where you test. And of course, you expect with a more highly heritable trait like oil that the genetic correlations are even stronger across sites. Now, if you want to prove that you have real genetic gain, there's a few things you have to do. And Walsh and Lynch, the uh, 2018 quantitative genetics textbook, which um, written by those two genii, is that the plural of geniuses? <laughs> um, they have a little page there talking about what you have to do to prove you've got realized genetic gain and you're not getting fooled by correlated information. So the first thing you have to do is to show that the sites did not increase in yield over cycles. Because if a site's increased in yield over cycles, you could be confusing genetic gain with improvement in the environment, right? So luckily for us, uh, from 2020 to 2016, there's no real genetic association between years and yield, or at least the mean yield of site did not increase over cycles. So therefore, if we can obtain estimates of positive genetic gain over cycles, they were not due to improving environments. Phew, okay, got that one ticked off. What else do we have to do? Well, it would be nice if you had relatively low G by E. Why? Genotype by environment interaction could really um, make it less believable that your genetic gain was global. So you've got a global series of testing sites. Is your genetic gain global? So we use the factor analytic model to test all of those locations across cycles. And the FA1 model is supposed to tell you about variety mean effects. And this accounted for 63% of the variance in the data. So that's pretty high for an FA1 model. So it tells you that the variety mean effects are pretty high already. And if you go to FA2, and now you're starting modeling G by E, it jumps up to 68%, which is not much. So this is another case of saying, well, good, then we have a very strong main effect of genotype in this data set, and the environment has a relatively small role to play. And there was a high correlation of yield of genotypes across Canada and Australia, as we just mentioned, so therefore we can be confident that the genetic gain in yield that we achieved, a 4.6% per annum, was truly global main effect expressed in most environments. So uh, with Felipe's help, we were able to graph these um, cycle effects for breeding values, cycle one, two, three, four, and a hypoth hypothetical cycle five. It's yield breeding values on the vertical axis, so they're centred around zero. That's the overall mean of the whole experiment. And as you can see, we started out below the mean in cycle one. We didn't actually include this data in the analysis because I really didn't know what I was doing then. And that's true. 
Um, but imagine if we had just kept going along here. Um, my colleagues in Germany and Canada would have said, why are you wasting your time? <clears throat> but after the fact, we've now done the analysis and we can be confident that after we started implementing those technologies coming out of animal breeding, we could make genetic gain. And this is a significant genetic improvement. And in fact, the software MateCell, which is optimal contribution software, tells us that in cycle five, we predict another boost of 4.5% in genetic gain in grain yield, predicted in two years' time. That's the beauty of this software. So the slope is going up, and it looks like it's continuing to go up, and we're starting to leave behind the uh, commercial varieties in Australia now. But we started out not looking very good, and my colleagues were quite worried, but we are going up. Now, what's interesting about this slope is that it's four, four, uh, greater than 4% per year, and it's exactly the same as the slope we modelled in a hypothetical stochastic model with Brian Kinghorn and colleagues. And we are here at cycle four, and we're doing as well as the model predicted. People will always criticise modelling because it's just the model, and now we're starting to go up the slope predicted by the model. So imagine if we can double yield in the next 20 cycles. Now, nobody in the world anticipates doubling yield in 25 years, but potentially we could if we can keep this rate of genetic gain going. Of course, there's always other things that come in to slow you down. So we're going to talk about some of the things you have to get a compensation for, and one of them is that you need to select for other traits. Oil content, we are able to increase it every year. Protein content in the meal was also increased, slower than oil, but increased. We had very big gain in black leg. Now, these units for black leg score are resistance units. So the higher you get, the better you are for resistance, and we jumped up very quickly. That's levelling off a bit now, but we're now into an acceptable level of resistance for the southern Australian black leg environment. But there were unintended consequences. I mentioned at the beginning that plant height of progenies tends to be higher than Australian varieties, and, and that's exactly what happened. Here's your Australian controls, and here's the cycles. And as we were going up, my German colleagues were getting nervous. This is getting too tall. You need to do something. So we started winding back our selection for height, penalising tall plants, and the same thing with flowering time. It started out late, it got later, people getting a bit nervous, start winding back in the index. Now we're achieving a reduction in flowering time. Now, why are these things happening? Unintended consequences happen because you have correlations between traits that you may not have anticipated as a breeder. And if you don't know about them, things will happen without your knowledge. And that's exactly what happened to us. Uh, yield was correlated with black leg, good. Black leg was correlated with days to flowering. So the later you are, the stronger your black leg resistance. Okay, uh, plant height was correlated with black leg. Yield was correlated with oil. The higher the yield, the better the oil content in the seed. All these things were interacting to increase plant height and days to flowering. And I did not know that. Ipso facto, I know, and now I hopefully can become a better breeder and avoid these negative consequences. So in conclusion, we have superior rates of genetic gain for multiple traits in a global spring canola program. Um, there is a qualification that this study was based on univariate factor analytic modelling, so one trait at a time across cycles. And Felipe has now described to you the benefit of multi-trait analysis. Um, so this is a future challenge, and um, I would uh, pass this challenge on to Kia in University of New England, who's sitting next to Dr. Lee, who does multivariate 
animal breeding analyses all the time. Um, so there's a challenge here to combine multivariate analysis of traits across cycles and with many sites. Uh, I would like to thank the NPZ and DLC's colleagues in Germany and Canada for their support, both financial and encouragement and feedback during this work. Uh, to my UWA NPZA project co-workers, Yasenka and Roz, a lot of the data you see here was uh, made by them physically in the field or in the lab. Uh, special thanks to co-authors of the forthcoming journal paper, Felipe, Katia, Dr. Lee, Olaf, Robert Banks and Brian in UNE, and uh, Sadiq, who if um, hadn't been here in 2012 or 2013, I may have been working somewhere else. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> It was a nice, it is a nice one. I'm glad you went in that order because you know, it, it's, it's just showing where it all came from, but also that, that passing on to and now to, to take it further. Um, and it's also nice just to see the power of those selection indices because you can make it go up or down. You can keep something constant if you want to. There'll be some things that you want to maintain a level and not change, and you can do that with the index as well. So exactly. That can be equally as important in some situations. So. Yes, uh, the index is very complex that I've been using and I've been using a very practical approach um, and I'm using Brian Kinghorn's mate cell to figure out what's the best index. Um, so you actually run his mating design software with your breeding values with a particular weighting on the index and you don't like the results so you try it again with a different weighting on the traits and that's how I came up with strongly negative weightings on height and flowering time. I really had to push it down and it really penalised the yield to do that, but I had to. Seems illogical, doesn't it? Why would you penalise yield just by decreasing height? Um, I don't know why, but I know I can find a high yielding short type because I've got enough variation in there to find it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the other thing. Questions for us? Yeah. Hi, well, it's very interesting to talk. Um, it seems that along with the yield, you have got um, the increasement, the increase in um, yield in oil content and in black leg resistance over the years. So um, when you present those data, we all know that there is large interaction of G by E. So when you present those data, were the experiment always undertaken under the same environment over different years? Um, no, a very good point, uh, especially like disease. Uh, we run disease in uh, field trials in Victoria because that's the most reliable place, but we keep moving the location. And I expected there to be a very strong G by E effect for black leg disease, but in fact, the correlations across cycles have been quite high, maybe 0.7. Uh, genetic correlation between cycles. So I can feel confident that what I'm getting is consistent expression of resistance. So I'm not getting huge variation in expression. There might be some, there, there is some variation, of course, um, but it's not dramatic. Um, so the greatest overwhelming uh, conclusion is that black leg resistance is consistently performing across years and the same for other traits. And yield was the big surprise. How could you get consistent performance across Canada and Australia? It seems impossible, but that's what we found. Yeah, because yeah. it's very different the environment, different temperature, humidity. Yeah. So I think it probably helps that we got rid of a lot yeah. of uh, rubbish in the early parts. So the Canadian trialing happened in cycles three and four. And the qualification there is, yes, we've got good correlations with Australian conditions in cycles three and four. I don't know what might have happened earlier. But the G by E is no different between Horsham and Winnipeg as between Horsham and Williams in Western Australia. There's no difference in the G by E. It's the same. 
can I just uh, seeing online there, I, I want to make sure we uh, incorporate the, the people online. So lots of good um, uh, thank yous from people. Uh, there's also a question, um, well, there's two questions there. One probably leads on a little bit from, from the one we've just had, but the first one's, would you please distinguish between phenotypic correlation and genotypic correlation? Uh, yes, so if I go back to Felipe's slide where he showed genetic variance and error, so we had error, non-additive and additive genetic variation. So phenotypic correlation is just taking everything. You don't know what's what, but you're correlating those effects and it includes error. Environmental error, you, you don't know. Um, that's what breeders used to do. Now you've got to reduce it down and the best you can do without pedigree is total genetic variation. With pedigree or genomic information, you can get to the breeding value. So we always work on genetic correlations of breeding values for that reason. Um, but phenotypic correlations exist and they're used in the uh, desire formula to weight the index. And Brian Kinghorn can tell you why. I don't understand why, but it's there. Yeah, yeah it is, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, from Kia, thanks, Wallace, for a great talk. Um, could you please explain how site consistency was evaluated? I assume by sowing commercial varieties in each cycle per site. Uh, yeah, good question. The numbers of common varieties across cycles was quite low, as you saw. And most uh, biometricians would say that's not enough concurrency of genotypes across cycles to really do anything. So we rely here on pedigree information. So those relationships that you see connect the cycles because mum and dad were in the previous cycle, but now you've got a self and a cross progeny in the current cycle. So the self and the cross progeny are related and they're related by common parents. So this increases your connectivity between cycles and therefore increases the number of equivalent genotypes across cycles. And it's the same principle for animal breeding. Mm. That's what you rely on. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, Ross. Uh, Ross Kingwell, uh, if meal and the protein content of meal become relatively more valuable than oil, how quickly can you reduce oil levels whilst boosting grain yield and increasing meal and its protein content? Uh, yes. So I could increase protein more efficiently now than I could before index selection. And what I did this year was I found that by sacrificing oil, I could get the protein to go up more. Um, if I was willing to sacrifice more oil, I could get the protein to go up more again. Um, but you uh, probably are aware that there's generally a negative correlation between yield and protein. As yield goes up, protein goes down. So there's going to be a trade-off there. So probably if you slow yield, slow oil, you can get much faster increase in protein. And, and I guess the only thing I would add, and you can um, disagree, is I guess you're in a position now to change more rapidly according to that by having an index-based selection and this knowledge. That's oh, the thing. You, you, you yeah. can now respond to change it. Genetics change, changing in genetics is not all, always rapid, but at least you're in a position to change it specifically to or customise it according to... Yeah, the index selection has um, enabled me to pull down height and uh, decrease flowering time. I deliberately did that, even though it was against my grain because its yield suffered. Mm. Uh, but as a breeder, you've got to be commercial about these things um, and you have to predict where you're going in the future. So the index allows you to still get the best possible yield while winding back those traits that you had to reduce. Because uh, can I just add, so I assume your index also uh, has a relative economic value yeah. as part of it. So there's a lot of work that goes into estimating those relative economic values. So at the end of the day, you're optimising the index for dollar value of the the outcomes from your breeding program. Is that a fair? Yeah. Yes, uh, that's fair. Uh, so the... reducing, <laughs> reducing yield is made up for by whatever the relative economic value of a 
Um, that's interesting that Ross asked the question because you've actually given a lead in here for Ross's um, answer. As agricultural economists here, we've got Amin Abadi also in the audience. Um, so I put the current, 12 months ago, value of canola yield, which is was $550 a tonne, that's now close to 1000 but mm. let's keep it at $550 a tonne. I put the bonification rate of oil in Western Australia, which pays farmers for higher oil, and then I just had to play with protein because those two were fixed. Well, there's no price for protein, but if I gave zero weighting to protein, it dropped. Dropped everything, yeah. So... I didn't want it to drop, so I had to give a positive weighting to protein. And it ended up I had to weight protein more than oil in order to get an increase in protein. So there's no farmer benefit for growing protein at the moment, but I gave it a benefit and it had to be greater than oil in order for it to go up. Yeah. Okay. Just conscious of the t is any other yeah. any final oh, questions sorry no 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 it's been great and i hope everyone online i i hope you feel like your questions have been answered um, um but really i just want to thank Felipe and, and uh, wallace for for for, uh, for their talk and, um, and before you finish i i Gave the wrong name. I said Amina Bari. He's my German colleague. Oh, so this is Armand Nagera. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Ross, Ross so, I have a German colleague who's probably wondering what on earth is he talking about. <laughs> Thank you. No, 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 but thanks to you both. Uh, and I, I think it is, it's just an exciting thing. Uh, you talked about GNI, if that's the um, thing. But I think just being open to um, to new ways of looking at how we increase uh, genetic gain, whether it's livestock or plants, has been fantastic. Mm -hmm. And you really have pioneered that. So I, I think it's fantastic to hear where that NPZ program's gone. So mm -hmm. thanks for asking. Can I just join with me in thanking both Felipe and Amanda.